Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the European Quantum Leadership Session 2 on quantum communication. Um, with this session, we want to show how Europe paves its way to its industrial leadership. And um, once again, we have great speakers here, a great panel, um, <clears throat> and they will present you some insights into their visions, products, success stories, and collaborations um, of the leading startups, corporates, and RTOs um, as key to position themselves and Europe as a leader. Um, as I told you last time in our last um, European Quantum Leadership Session on Quantum Computing, um, the European quantum community is a very strong one. We have brilliant researchers and great engineers. Um, <clears throat> there is a huge potential for industrial users. And uh, we have yeah, at the moment enough private and public funding. So France announced um, a lot of funding, um, Germany too. We have the quantum flagship and additional investments through the IEC um, <clears throat> accelerator and um, some additional uh, investments through, measure, through measure, measures in response to COVID. Um, <clears throat> so I think our position is very great and the rest is up to us, um, to the quantum community in general. And um, yeah, as I told you um, also in our last session, um, the greatest challenge um, in the development of a network of QBN, the quantum business network, um, <clears throat> was um, yeah about the commitment um, of uh, different stakeholders. But with the support of the amazing QBN members, I was able to add a cluster management um, to the community. And I did this because a network is more than an ecosystem. In an ecosystem, Okay. So in an ecosystem, every person and every organization is in charge of their own partnerships and their own business development. Adding a cluster management to this community um, that supports all stakeholders and manages the collaboration processes within the ecosystem provides additional value to the whole ecosystem. And QBN started um, with the aim to build Europe's best quantum business network to transform the quantum community to a strong quantum industry. Therefore, we promote um, networking, business creation, and the development of organizations in the fields of quantum technologies in general and its value chains. <clears throat> We do this with a colorful bunch of activities. Networking is the most important one for a network, I think. Um, we support the initiation of collaboration. Uh, we support startups um, in yeah, the funding process, um, uh, the funding process, but also with business development um, and other activities. Um, we provide marketing support. We have a quantum job board um, to find yeah, the next talents for your organization, <clears throat> we support your business development, um, provide access to public and private funding, and we have some additional paid services for our members. Um, the most important thing for the network, um, for knowledge exchange and um, technology transfer are the QBN meetings. These are <clears throat> um, exclusive working groups um, for the different fields of uh, quantum technology, means sensing, simulation, communication, computing, and also the quantum enabling technologies. And within these meetings, we um, discuss um, and, and identify relevant R&D trends and business trends for quantum technologies, um, as well as initiate um, yeah, new collaborations and um, business opportunities. <clears throat> so we want to provide with this expert meetings, a trust-based environment for professional exchange and personal networking. I want to invite you to join the growing network to transform the European quantum community to a strong industry together. And here are some upcoming dates. I think for you are the most is the most important one, the QBN meeting on quantum communication, supported by TZ Spacecom on March 23. <clears throat> yeah, with this, um, I want to hand over to Frank. Um, he organized uh, the meeting or the European Quantum Leadership Session together with me. He's managing director of Optech BB, and 
he will present you Object BB in a few words, I think. Thank you, Hannes. And if you allow me to share yeah. my screen real quick. So welcome everybody. Uh, so my name is Frank Leutsch. I'm the uh, managing director of Optech BB, uh, the photonics network in uh, Berlin and Brandenburg. So please allow me to also. Yeah, you should be possible to state some words on good old photonics. Uh, I think we all know that uh, photonics are at the core of uh, what is nowadays called uh, quantum technologies. So I prepared just one slide, not to bore you too much. Are you like to share? No, not yet. No, not yet. Okay. Um... Maybe you need to unshare. Well, maybe yeah, um, yeah. while Johannes is uh, trying to uh, unshare his slides. Um, well, Optech BB is, uh, as I said, the photonics network in, in the Berlin Brandenburg region. And uh, here in, in Berlin, we have a very long tradition uh, in photonics. It's actually dating back uh, 200 years. Uh, and today we have uh, more than 400 uh, technology oriented uh, and photonics and microsystems technology based uh, companies in the region. About 300 are actually located uh, in the city of Berlin and around 100 are located uh, in the surrounding state of Brandenburg. And what's really unique uh, here in the region is the rich environment uh, on research and development with 10 universities and universities of applied sciences in the field and 26 non-university research institutions like Fraunhofer Institutes and Leibniz Institutes. Um, here in the region, we have about 16,000 uh, employees active in photonics um, and about uh, 2.8 billion uh, in revenues each year. And the competences uh, lie in uh, traditionally in lighting technologies. Uh, I think nowadays one can also say uh, traditionally also in laser technologies. Uh, there's a rich community actually in sensor technologies, metrology and optical analytics. Uh, of course, we also have a um, rich environment of uh, clinics and uh, companies uh, in biomedical uh, photonics ophthalmology. And of course, um, also traditionally, uh, there's a huge community on optical communication. And uh, so I'm uh, very happy uh, that we uh, today have actually two members of Optech BB uh, in the group of presenting um, uh, people today, um, Adva and um, the Heinrich Herz Institute. Uh, and here in the region of Berlin and Brandenburg, uh, we have uh, particular competences in the field of quantum technologies uh, in quantum communication and uh, quantum sensing. And of course, uh, Optech BB is not standing alone. Uh, we are part of the larger uh, German network, uh, OptechNet Germany. Um, and of course, we are taking part in uh, networking activities on the European level. Uh, we are part of the EPIC community and uh, you're probably aware of uh, uh, the Photonics Plus uh, event uh, next week. And of course, uh, the group of EPIC is also holding a number of uh, technology oriented and also quantum technology meetings. And uh, my last point, I would like to raise uh, your attention also to some uh, dates. Um, uh, Johannes already mentioned um, one of them actually um, in the European Quantum Leadership uh, Program, um, the 14th um, of April uh, on quantum sensing. But as I said, uh, there are, uh, as you all know, there are much more uh, events uh, on the calendar. And I think, uh, Johannes, I can also invite everybody uh, to uh, uh, an event in Arizona, actually. So across the ocean, uh, Johannes um, uh, will take part in a discussion on the 4th of uh, March uh, in the course of, uh, of the Arizona uh, Photonics Days. I don't know, will you put something on, on your website as well? I hope you do. Uh, so save the date for that and um, OpTechNet Germany and Spectaris, uh, they are hosting, organizing a meeting on the 23rd uh, of um, March on quantum sensing. So save the date for those events. And uh, with that, uh, I would already like to hand over again uh, to Johannes to start with the meeting. Yeah, thank you very much, Frank. Um, I just want to share one more slide. <clears throat> and say a few words to the European Quantum Leadership Session. So this will, webinar or workshop is uh, being recorded. Uh, you can watch it later on demand on the QBN YouTube channel. Uh, you can ask questions via the Zoom QBA box, uh, Q&A box. Um, and all the speakers will be able to um, answer the questions um, during and after uh, the talks. 
If you have any questions regarding the European Quantum Leadership Sessions, um, you can write us an email and don't forget to follow us on, uh, on, um, <clears throat> on Xing, Twitter and um, uh, LinkedIn. And if you like the content, um, also subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, click the bell to be notified for new content and uh, give us a like. And now I, we can start with the first speaker. Uh, it's Maxim Sich um, from AJIC. He is a uh, co-founder and CEO of AJIC and he will share um, his vision <clears throat> on the evolution and future of quantum optical communications. Maxim, the virtual floor is yours and I will stop to share my screen. Yeah, well, thanks very much for introduction and for having me. So if you give me a quick second to start sharing my slides. Um, right, so yes, I'm Max. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of EJIC. Um, so we're a spin-off uh, from University of Sheffield in the UK, and uh, we work on quantum photonics. And today I would really like to talk about the, uh, well, actually the very exciting uh, topic of, of quantum communication and then quantum uh, encryption and how we see it uh, developing. So I'll probably start with something that um, a lot of people would know already. Uh, and this is kind of a starting point of, of many discussions in, uh, in around quantum encryption and why you actually need it. Um, it's, it's because quantum computing is, is, is a double-edged sword. So, um, well, it, it's pretty soon that uh, you're going to see, uh, you know, things being hacked. Our traditional encryption is not going to be able to stand a chance uh, against that. And so, you know, there's slowly there is a recognition of, of this amongst the industry, uh, you know, uh, and key players um, all over. But nevertheless, uh, you know, the best solution there is to, is to deal with quantum by the quantum means. And, you know, if you want to build the, uh, the communication stack bottom up, all quantum enabled and quantum secure, uh, you know, your only choice is, is photons. I mean, be it uh, visible, infrared, microwave, uh, but it would have to be photons. Uh, that's the only available choice for us for now. And I would really like to start here to show, you know, where we are compared to where we would be. So uh, well, here's, a, here's a map of internet, uh, which is kind of old already. So that has grown significantly since then, uh, but it's, it's still being possible to even map it uh, by now. And, you know, it all started by simple uh, small test networks that were here and there. And it is one of those, you know, one of the early ones uh, in the US. And so we we're in sort of similar stage now uh, with our quantum networking. So I've just put two examples here uh, like from the UK and China, but uh, many countries now have these projects in place, including Germany. Um, so uh, there's a lot going on, but you kind of can draw those uh, maps with, a, you know, a pen uh, and a paper and you would take whatever 20, maybe 30 notes and you'd be done. And it's really far away from what the whole uh, network is. So I think it just shows how exciting this opportunity is for, for everybody and how much work actually is ahead of us as well. Um, so the way we uh, uh, look in this is to kind of break it down a little bit into sort of generations of uh, technological kind of approaches and sets is how we see them them coming. So I'd like to, I mean, this blurry thing is, is real um, on this slide, so don't worry. So I'd like to talk you through these points and see, you know, how we see the evolution happening uh, in the past, now, and in, in the future, and, and how we are uh, hoping to support this uh, happening. So, you know, the, the first generation, it's, it's basically proof of principle. Yes, it works. I mean, it's the, uh, it's the time of the classic low triangle with Alice, Bob, and Eve in the middle. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, some basic technology has been tried. Um, but something we uh, should look in here is like how much it costs. And uh, the cost of these technologies is it's quite expensive I and mean, it's uh, almost uh, not viable for a commercial use in that sense. And so the, the, the basic thing there is it's the quantum key distribution as the most readily available approach and something everybody's looking right now. 
So I put here an example of the Misus mission from, from China, um, which the, together was um, Austrian University. And the key thing there is was the data in transit is actually still digital, you know, the in storage is still digital, the capacity is limited, um, but yeah, it did work. So it's, it's awesome. So the next thing that is happening now, and that's the kind of, you know, it's just building the global links. So we have a host of technologies, you know, including ours. And uh, today we'll hear a couple of, I'm pretty sure, very interesting insights on, on, on how this can be done. It's how to build an economically viable links, which take us into uh, at least a global network of, of communications. Um, it still kind of uses the same uh, approach, uh, but it's, you know, more powerful, has more capacity. You know, it should be able to deal with the peak demands. And one thing really important to notice um, and to note here is that uh, to build a global network, we need satellites. So uh, unlike with fiber optic, where you can sort of put everything under the ocean and potentially have a full global network without the air component, um, then quantum networks are very likely to happen without the satellite component. So satellite to satellite links or satellite to ground links and some basic networking. And we've seen that actually the first proposals were already like that. So you have a satellite link and a little bit of uh, ground-based network uh, with backbone fibers. And I think we should see things happening here. So uh, already interesting and the first commercial deployment. So this uh, image here is, for example, I think it's the Canadian QSAT mission. It's how they, you know, the visualization, something that should go live in the next uh, two years of the week. Um, so this is where, you know, the, the whole interest and the whole activity is now. Um, but there's one more thing which I would like to point out is that quantum is not quantum communication is not just about the better security, which is what everybody's talking about, um, but it's also about better speed. So if we move away from just quantum key distribution and go to quantum data distribution, where everything is quantum, this is where we're going to be able to show a much better performance than you currently have with any optical links or any fiber now. So, you know, it's going to be on the channel limit of the existing optical channels. This is what uh, the true power of quantum uh, communication is going to bring us. So, uh, you know, data in transit now becomes fully quantum. So it's a next step in, in terms of security, but also in terms of capability. Um, it should become, you know, real time. So that's not uh, like you have a key storage, you have a buffer somewhere, you know, it can be a day worth of buffer, it could be a second worth of buffer. No, it's, it's real time. It's like, how we use to internet today and you know that would require a huge constellation of satellites uh, supporting that uh, it would require 5g integration um, and the different different types of techs are gonna kind of spread uh, through all these uh, applications and the hybrid approach is also going to come in as well um, but that, that's about the where things get really exciting where you can leverage the entanglement on on a large scale and you know, the, the only thing left after that is, is building the, um, you know, a true quantum cloud, which would be, you know, data in storage have to be quantum, data in transit is quantum, and it's, it's a native link to quantum computing nodes. So pretty much what we have is digital, but it's all quantum. And it's about rebuilding all that, all that network and in completely new capability. So that is, um, I think that's, it's really, really exciting to see that, you know, we have that uh, technologies, you know, coming uh, forward. And, uh, you know, where we see us helping uh, building this whole uh, infrastructure is, um, well, just a quick, you know, recap of everything I was, uh, I was talking about. Um, but it's, it's a, just a gradual shift uh, in terms of, you know, digital to quantum. And then, uh, you know, we're going to have our quantum future. So this is, this is where we, uh, you know, uh, get here for, for, with our technology. And, um, you know, in this sense, less is more in quantum. So, um, so our, our technology, our core technology is, 
is a deal identical uh, and deterministic single fault on source, uh, which has got you know a lot of capability behind it. Uh, but that could allow you to build everything that you need, um, you know, starting from Gen two all the way into Gen four. And um, it's kind of a very very important thing to have um, for anybody. And so I would like to say that uh, if if you want to have it. Uh, you could uh, starting uh, from end of this year. So uh, if you're, you know, a researcher uh, or you're looking to uh, to play with some high quality uh, photon source, so this will be available end of this year, and f for a variety of applications. And I think uh, communications is one of them, but uh, as well as imaging, metrology, or computing. So I would uh, very much welcome, you know, any, uh, if, if you're interested in that, do get in touch. You know, we can talk about the uh, specs in, in quite a bit of detail and see, you know, uh, if we can do something special for you. Um, and with that, uh, actually, it was a pretty uh, quick. Um, I would like to thank you for, for the attention and, you know, join the quantum revolution. Yeah, thank you very much, Max, for this insightful talk. <clears throat> um, there is one question for you um, from the chat. Um, what is the technical reason behind favoring satellites over fiber links for the global quantum network? Uh, it's, uh, again, so well, think about quantum as a game of losses. And uh, losses in fibers are more than losses in uh, free space, especially in the upper outer space uh, transmissions. And so for quantum, it's really important to, um, to have as low losses as possible. And for that reason, satellites are now becoming much more uh, available in terms of cost. They're a lot cheaper than they were, for example, 30 years ago when fiber, uh, fiber infrastructure was being built or like even before that. So uh, it seems that it's a lot more economical for firstly, satellites become cheaper and more powerful and in terms of the capability they can deliver. And um, second, uh, nobody really sees the possibility to sort of send, uh, you know, a few thousand kilometers of fiber link without any interruptions, trusted nodes. So that would mean that in some places you'd have to build uh, kind of stations in the middle of the ocean um, to supplement because uh, that is one of the challenges in, in quantum. It's the, the trusted nodes. So whilst, you know, more high performance uh, technologies that are coming out now would allow to significantly reduce those, uh, you still would need to have them. And satellites work as this uh, kind of equivalent in some ways. And on top of that, again, it's cheaper. I mean, anything that doesn't require laying physical cables these days is significantly prefer more preferred, which is why we have 5G, for example, coming out. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a second question. Um, if you think of an European quantum internet, how should this work with citizens and industry? So, I mean, the, the very first users are going to be high value industries, um, you know, telecom operators. So in end users like citizens, they won't, uh, the best thing you can imagine about quantum internet for end users is that they won't notice that it happened. Because the point where they will notice that it didn't happen is when they suddenly start losing data, you know, and uh, it, it becomes really a uh, bad situation. So the best case scenario, you don't even know it happened. And your, your life is awesome. That, that's the, uh, the kind of thing how we would um, work for, I think, for friend users. But for uh, kind of industrial customers, um, you know, the people already start investing, especially high value uh, manufacturing. Um, they already, you know, there are pilot projects uh, across Europe and several places to um, just implement the quantum encryption, QKD encryption in between sites to secure the data. And, you know, the next thing is kind of government departments or, you know, financial services are already looking into uh, building their own networks or uh, trying to pursue uh, network providers to offer them the service. I hope that answers the question. 
I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Max. Um, I think you will be there um, to answer further questions. Um, so if anyone has no questions for Max, um, please put it in the Q&A box. And with this, I will hand over to Frank. Thank you, Johannes. Um, and I would like to introduce the next speaker. Um, Dr. Jasper Rüdiger is a project manager at the Fraun of HHI here in Berlin. Uh, so I'm very happy that uh, you are here with us today. He started to work at the Fraunhofer HHI uh, already in 2014, and he's researching quantum cryptography in free space optical communication in the Department of Photonic Networks and Systems. And in his dissertation, which he finished uh, just last year, 2020, at the Humboldt University in Berlin, he was working on time frequency quantum key distribution. and. Uh, uh, he was applying uh, free space uh, optical links uh, to that. So uh, already a very nice connection to the first talk. Um, and in his presentation today, he will inform us about the new trends uh, towards uh, German quantum communication infrastructure. So uh, Dr. Rüdiger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. For the kind of production, I want to start with a little uh, outline of the talk. Um, I want, uh, yeah, I will start by introducing the Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute, who we are. Uh, then I will talk about um, yeah, what's about the QNET project. That's really where the um, title of my talk comes from. Towards the German quantum communication infrastructure. That's really what this project is about. And then I will talk about further activities in the realm of quantum. Uh, communication in the Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute. So the Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute, um, can I remove the right side here a little bit? The Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute is uh, over 90 years old already, and, and we do uh, yeah, optical communication since uh, around about 60 years now, and we are a member of the Fraunhofer uh, society uh, since 18 years now. So our research topics are mainly information technology, modern communication networks, and multimedia systems. Um, out of the six departments of our institute, two are um, active in quantum technologies. That's for once the photonic components department. They are um, working on photonic chips, basically. And the second is the photonics networks and systems department, where I'm part of, uh, we have more view, uh, a point of view from the networks and systems um, point of view. The, so what is our vision um, in the QNET uh, consortium? Our perspective on quantum communication is that uh, in the near future, we uh, will want to implement quantum key distribution um, networks, so networks out of point of point-to-point -point quantum key distribution links for key infrastructure, like for example, government agencies. In the future, uh, it will be very important to um, swap out these uh, trusted nodes with repeater nodes. We are also involved in a project uh, about quantum repeaters. I will tell you about that a little bit later. And with this kind of um, repeater network, it will be possible to not only have secure communication, but also have, um, for example, stuff like uh, cloud quantum computing, clock synchronization, and stuff like that. So the QNET um, project is uh, yeah, a seven-year project with uh, four founding members, which are us, the Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute, uh, the Fraunhofer IOF, the Max Planck Institute for Light, and the DLR. And the goal is to develop hardware, software, and technologies Towards an agile and adaptive, towards agile and adaptive solutions. Uh, that means that um, we want to look at heterogeneous systems, so systems operating over free space, operating over fiber, but also has links to satellites, and uh, look at multi-user scenarios. We want to have scalable hybrid solutions, so we are, want to look at different kinds of uh, quantum key distribution protocols. We are not looking at just one specific protocol, but we want to be open to a lot of protocols. For example, discrete variable QKD and uh, uh, continuous variable QKD. 
uh, one important part in the project from the beginning on is uh, to have demonstrators in the real world, so in the real environments of telecom uh, networks. Um, and another important part is also the certification and standardization, where we are working closely together with the DSI and with the industry. And of course, we are not um, living in a vacuum. Uh, we want to have strong links to the other quantum initiatives uh, in Germany, but also in Europe. Some of them are mentioned here, and in, in some of them we as HHI are also involved in. So the project is a seven-year project. We are currently at the beginning of uh, the second year in the first phase of three phases. And the idea is really that um, in the beginning, we are those four, let's say, founding partners. But over time, the amount of activities from the industry should increase. So this is really meant as an invitation to um, also the audience, to uh, key players, to relevant partners who can participate in this um, uh, QNET project in the future phases. So that's really, uh, yeah, see that as an invitation to contact us if uh, you want to participate. Um, in this first phase, uh, this is further divided into uh, two phases, QNET Alpha and QNET Beta. Uh, we are currently uh, in the end of QNET Alpha and uh, QNET Beta already started, but that's not that uh, important for this talk. Uh, I want in this talk to uh, tell you a little bit about our activities in QNET Alpha. So we at HHI are very well suited for this kind of um, project because we have really the whole value chain available in-house. Um, we have the core technologies, we have chip integration. For example, we can integrate nonlinear optic elements into our optical chips. Uh, we have stuff like um, uh, detectors uh, we can implement. We can implement whole components. For example, here, this is a discrete variable QKD uh, system. Uh, um, also implemented in our pulley board platform. I will tell you about this a little bit later as well. Uh, and also we have uh, know-how in the field of uh, continuous variable QKD. And we, especially our department in the systems and networks uh, area, and want to put all this together in uh, working um, system solutions. So here you can already see the prototypes we have developed in this QNET Alpha phase. So as I said, one important part of this QNET Alpha phase is to have a demonstrator uh, in the real world. So sadly, um, yeah, this uh, demonstration was already planned for last December, joined uh, demonstration with all four partners, uh, but due to the um, COVID pandemic uh, that didn't happen and it's now planned for the beginning of the year, but I can al already tell you um, what uh, we're going to do here. So uh, the idea is that we have a, a demonstration in Bonn and interconnect to government agencies, namely the BMBF and the DSI, and uh, we want to connect them over yeah, as what I mentioned before, over different um, transmission media, over fiber, over free space, and over hybrid uh, links. And yeah, we are, as I said, we are not looking at one single QKD protocol. We are really open. We want to have uh, different protocols here. So we uh, are implementing discrete vari variable QKD protocols, continuous variable QKD protocols. Uh, uh, here as well. And we have the full stack here. So from key um, exchange um, to uh, uh, key management, uh, decryption, encryption, and so forth. Um, yes, uh, you can, yeah, our part in, the, in this demonstrator is to develop the discrete variable uh, QKD system. The Max Planck Institute develops the continuous wave, uh, the continuous variable QKD system and um, the DLR develops a, a, an entanglement-based uh, QKD system in the 800 nanometer um, uh, area and also is um, responsible for the free space uh, links. Roughly saying, of course, we are strongly interconnected in all what we are doing. All should be working in parallel. All should be working uh, yeah, uh, good together. So 
This is a bigger picture of our system we have developed in this project. This on the left, you can see the sender unit, Alice. On the right, you can see the sender, uh, the receiver unit, Bob. I just want to mention a few key parameters about the system. As I said, this is a discrete variable, QKD system. Uh, it's based on the DB84 protocol. Um, it uses the time phase qubit and uh, an optimized decoy method is implemented as well. So on the right here, you can see the um, states we are using here, the four states, the time and phase, uh, and the two intensities for the decoy method. The wavelength we are using is 1550 nanometer, and the clock frequency is um, 625 megahertz. And uh, here we are using a lot of commercially available uh, components, which uh, later should, swap, should be swapped out with um, uh, specified components we will develop in the project as well. Uh, for example, a commercial key management system is also used here. And I said already that um, sadly the uh, demonstration could not happen yet. As I said, it's planned for the first half of this year, um, but we could already do a joint preliminary uh, test run. Here are a few pictures and a few results about that. Here you can see our um, sender and receiver units in action, uh, connected via a fiber link. And uh, in this experiment, um, co-propagation from our system with the uh, um, continuous variable system was performed. And yeah, as you might know, one key parameter of uh, quantum key distribution is the quantum bit error rate. And we could show that the quantum bit error rate is suitable uh, low to enable um, quantum key distribution. We did that over fiber, as I said, but we also did that over um, free space. Uh, on the right here in this three pictures, you can see the basically the free space uh, uh, range. Uh, here on the right, you see the transmitter, so basically Alice. And here on the left, you can see uh, two containers, one uh, with, a with telescopes inside. You can also see, uh, you cannot see, but in this cycle, you see the sender, uh, the Alice sender, um, is basically here, there's a line of sight for the free space um, connection. And next to it, there's a QKD container where both systems from a Max Planck Institute and from us are inside. Besides this uh, demonstrations, uh, this demonstration, we are also, as I mentioned previously, we are also um, developing some key components for the system, which eventually should uh, go into the system. Uh, one of which are those detectors. So the more conventional type of detector with um, vertical coupling is uh, shown here, but we also can implement um, basically horizontal uh, coupling via um, waveguides into the detector, which has also some, adva uh, some advantages, um, yeah, like for example, the, efficient, the coupling efficiency. Those detectors, <coughs> Those detectors work uh, in a wavelength range between 1064 and 1650 nanometers, and they don't, don't need to be cooled cryogenically. Another, <clears throat> another example uh, is this um, polarization encoding BB84 transmitter. Uh, this is um, implemented on our polyboard platform, uh, which is a really nice platform where you can do all kinds of stuff. So that's basically just an example of what we can do with this platform. Uh, and here you can see that there are all kinds of functionalities you need for QKD uh, implemented. There's a SMF coupling, so single mode fiber coupling on the right. There is an attenuator, there are filters. Uh, you can attach lasers to it and all on this um, polyboard platform. You can see a picture of this here on the right. Uh, that was basically the QNET project, but we are also involved in other types uh, of projects. I will uh, quickly go over in the next, in the last couple of slides. Uh, one of which is the BMBF project QLink X. Uh, it's a project with, I think there are 24 partners. Um, and yeah, I mentioned before, this is a project where um, um, the development of basic building blocks of the quantum repeater is uh, the goal. I don't want to go too much into detail, but here on the right, you can see basically the schematic of 
uh, quantum repeater, and you can basically divide the quantum repeater into different uh, building blocks. For example, the quantum repeater node, quantum repeater segment, quantum repeater cell. And this uh, different um, building blocks shall be um, demonstrated in this project. And for this, different kinds of components need to be developed. Um, yeah, spin photon entanglement is important. Quantum memories are needed to develop, to be developed, uh, quantum gates. And of course, everything should be um, efficiently be, uh, can, should be manipulated efficiently, read out uh, efficiency and so on. Um, it's at this point not yet clear uh, which kind of material platform is suited best for quantum repeaters. Maybe there is no best, maybe uh, they have all their strengths and weaknesses uh, depending on the use case. Um, but in this project, uh, three different material platforms are looked at. Firstly, defect centers in the diamond. Uh, secondly, uh, sem semiconductor quantum dots. And thirdly, uh, trapped ions and atoms. And all this uh, should then be used to implement those building blocks. We as HHI, uh, our task in this project is to really bring this um, uh, quantum repeater uh, functionalities into action in the real world, let's say. So uh, together with the telecom, uh, we want to test those um, functionalities over uh, over our deployed fiber uh, test bed. We are also in, uh, developing an entangled photon source. You can see it here on the bottom left. And we also have um, connections to our uh, free space test bed, where we have different free space ranges here from HHI, between the HHI and different buildings to test uh, stuff over the free space links. Another um, interesting project is again a BMBF project together with uh, Uni Münster, together with Entropy, and together with um, PicoQuant, where uh, a superconducting nanowire single photon detector array with 64 detectors uh, will be developed. And um, if you know anything about superconducting nanowire detectors, is that uh, they need to be uh, cooled cryogenically. So I think three Kelvins is uh, where they operate. Um, and for this, a compact cryostat is uh, developed by Entropy. The detectors it's themselves are developed by University of Münster. Um, and of course, all the photons that you measure, you want to um, read out. And so a time correlated single photon counting unit is developed by uh, PicoQuant uh, to yeah, deal with those parallel uh, data piling up from the uh, detectors. And our goal, our task in this project is to uh, yeah, demonstrate a use case for this uh, detector array. And we want to demonstrate, <clears throat> we want to demonstrate a quantum key distribution uh, system uh, utilizing the high number of detectors available. So we have uh, developed a quantum key distribution system. It's based on the coherent one-way QKD protocol uh, cow protocol, um, and uh, yeah, we want to use those 64 detectors to multiplex uh, 32 uh, wavelength channels uh, together, um, yeah, for 32 uh, quantum channels together. And for this, we have developed a simplified receiver, um, which only uses, I don't want to go too much into detail here, but uh, it only uses one interferometer. Uh, and yeah, we could already implement this for four channels. The detectors are not yet available to us. They will, of course, only be available in the end of the project. Uh, but um, we could already show that it works with um, four wave, uh, wavelengths channels. And it also works. And we could also already show that uh, it scales to this uh, 32 multiplex channels as well. This, <coughs> this is not only. Um, This is not only uh, simplifying the setup itself, but also simplifies the uh, stability of the system. So stabilization of the system uh, is more easy this way. So 
as I said, uh, the interferometer's key parameter is basically the visibility, which is high enough for this 32 channels. But we can also show that um, it's yeah, with just changing this one parameter, the visibility of uh, this interferometer, we can um, stabilize the system. You can see here that the total visibility is degenerating over time, but uh, we can, by just changing this one parameter, we can bring it back up to a high number. Um, yeah, so we can show that uh, this is, uh, it's easily possible to stabilize this kind of system. And with this preliminary uh, QKD system with just four channels, we could already show that um, a key rate of one megabit per second is possible. We are not only involved in um, German projects, we are also involved in uh, European projects like the quantum, uh, like within the quantum flagship initiative. For example, uh, we are involved in the unicorn project. And here again, this polyboard platform plays a huge role. Um, in this case, this polyboard platform is polyboard platform is used to produce entangled photons to have a, a entangled photon source. Um, but this platform is really versatile. You can have all kinds of uh, different functionalities you can put on this um, photonic chips. Uh, one example, uh, which I think is very nice, is uh, this. Uh, grin lenses you can uh, use to have little free space parts on your chip. So you have your grin lens, you can basically couple out of the waveguide in a free space part and couple back in, um, the, wave uh, in, in, in the waveguide again. And in this free space part, you can basically do whatever you want. And in this case here, um, uh, nonlinear crystal is put here to produce those entangled photons. Uh, but yeah, you can really do anything here. You can uh, do all kinds of stuff, especially nonlinear optic uh, stuff, which you cannot do on the chip itself. And yeah, again, uh, all kinds of other functionalities are here as well. Uh, it's not the same chip here on the right, but the basic functionalities are the same. You see this uh, fiber coupling. Uh, you see the uh, crystal put inside this free space uh, area. You see the green lenses. So that's really, um, an amazing platform where you can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, we call it the optical bench on a chip. So basically what uh, in the lab, a big optical bench can do, you can do it uh, on this uh, optical chip. Very interesting what the colleagues at the photonic components department do here. So that is basically <clears throat> my last slide. Um, that's another quantum flagship project. Uh, this time it's called uh, Civic uh, here. The goal is to apply continuous variable quantum key distribution in existing telecom infrastructure. And the part of the Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute here is um, yeah, for this uh, continuous variable QKD, uh, you need coherent detection at the receiver side. And uh, the Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute here develops um, a receiver unit doing this coherent detection. Okay, as I said, this was my um, last slide. I hope you learned something about our activities. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer questions now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rüdiger, for your very interesting uh, talk and uh, very um, overwhelming overview of your projects uh, uh, on the new infrastructure. Um, Johannes, I'm not sure if I see all the questions. Uh, there's one question uh, actually in the Q&A box. Uh, addressing the uh, photonic or poly uh, um, board platform for 810 mm -hmm. nanometers. And the question is, uh, what is used? Is it silicon nitride? And could you also use uh, glass waveguides for that? Or what are the waveguides? Um, so just, um, uh, I'm really not the expert here. That's um, the project uh, is from the components department. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, I think it's a polymer chip. Um, so uh, yeah, everything inside there is uh, in, in, in polymer. So that's where the name comes from. All right, thank you very much. And um, I've seen um, there are already a lot of questions uh, being raised uh, also to previous speakers. And I would like to encourage you to actually do that. Uh, just use an ad uh, before the name of uh, the speaker you want to address. 
And uh, if there are no further questions, because I don't see any, Johannes, do you see yeah, any? I have one further question um, okay, go ahead, from the registration form before. Um, how important is standardization for, your, for you in the transfer of your technology from science to the market? I think that's a perfect question for Fraunhofer because you are working between science and uh, markets. Yes, it's uh, very important, um, especially in the QNET project, uh, we are... Um, Yeah, working together with the BSI and also the industry, uh, it's a very a big goal in this QNET initiative to also drive uh, standardization uh, as well. So it's a really a big topic there. Okay, do, do you have more experience, um, initial experience with standardization in this topic? And me personally, I uh, have no experience in standardization yet, but um, we are really thinking about that. That's also, I haven't mentioned that, but um, I mean, Up to standardization for QKD is uh, very new, let's say, and so uh, the QKD systems should all work also with already standardized um, classical cryptography. So you don't not only have your quantum key distribution and uh, using the keys there, but on top of that you have standardized. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then thanks again. And um, we will go to the next speaker. Um, it's Dr. Alexander Regnard. Um, he studied, ex uh, studied experimental solid state physics, physics and uh, is now co-founder and managing director of QTRA, a spin-off of the Technical University of Munich. And he will tell us more about the innovative uh, magnetic refrigerators for quantum detectors and quantum communication. Alexander, the virtual stage is yours. Thanks, Johannes, for the kind introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me well and also see the slides. So, Johannes, can you give me just a thumbs up? If yeah, that is perfect. Okay? Great, thanks. So, as Johannes just mentioned, um, my name is Alexander Regnard. I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of um, QTRA. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, participate in today's QBN session um, on quantum communication. And um, I would like to thank all of you for joining. And I would particularly like to thank Johannes and the QBN for their organization and inviting me to this talk. Um, probably many of you will hear the first time about QTRA. And in fact, we're still a very young company and also a brand new member of QBN. Um, and therefore I would like to um, spend a couple of minutes to introduce to you QTRA, our mission and the technology that we're using. In the second part of the presentation, I will tell you a bit more about our connection to quantum communication and what solutions we develop and offer already to support the research and also the industrial adoption of QKD. So to begin with, QTRA is a cryogenics company. That means we're suppliers for low temperature equipment for state-of-the-art science and technology. At QTRA, we focus on easy to use cryostats to support researchers in fundamental science and material science on fast characterization tools to accelerate the development and increase the productivity, for instance, in the prototyping and the testing of quantum hardware. And finally, we focus on platforms for continuous, but at the same time, helium-3 free sub-Kelvin cooling. And we do this because we believe that such helium-3 free cooling will be key for scalable and affordable applications of quantum electronics. So QTRA was incorporated in 2018 as a spin-off from the Department of Physics at the Technical University of Munich. And in 2019, we set up our own office and production in downtown Munich. We're still an active part of the scientific community. We're doing our own R&D to constantly improve our magnetic refrigeration technology and to come up with innovative, truly cryogen-free cooling solutions. And this mindset is also reflected in several corporate memberships, in our close collaborations with other quantum hardware companies and university research groups. Our scientific background and our partnerships um, give us a good understanding for current pains and needs in the context of low temperature applications. And we try to provide suitable cooling solutions for these needs based on our magnetic refrigeration technique. QTRA has a small but agile and certainly expert team. 
um, including mechanical engineers, software developers, and of course, several low temperature physicists who bring in many years of hands-on experience in cryoengineering, low temperature research, and magnetic refrigeration. And our team is constantly growing. So if you're interested in joining Qtra, please also check our website and send an email to talents at qtra.com. So I already mentioned magnetic refrigeration a couple of times. Let me now briefly introduce to you this cooling technology, which we use in our products. Magnetic refrigeration, also known as ADR, which is short for adiabatic demagnetization refrigeration, is a well-established technique to provide sub-Kelvin cooling for typically several hours. This method does not require helium-3 and can be impl implemented completely cryogen-free. It is therefore a very simple and robust technology. The working principle um, is based on the magnetocaloric effect of a solid state cooling medium. It is shown schematically on this infographic, but I will only briefly highlight the most important points here. So in the beginning of the re refrigeration process, um, the cooling medium is magnetized and the heat of magnetization is dissipated in a heat bath, for instance, a mechanical cryocooler. The refrigerant is then disconnected from the heat bath by a heat switch. Finally, the cooling medium is demagnetized. Due to the magnetocaloric effect, the temperature of the cooling medium now drops as the magnetic field is lowered. This can be used to cool a sample that is attached to the medium for a whole time of typically several hours. Once the field has been reduced to zero, the cooling stops. And now the cooling medium has to be regenerated to repeat the process. So it, that means the medium has to be magnetized once again. So this ADR principle is realized, for instance, in our S-type optical cryostat with an S100G configuration. In this configuration, the cryostat contains just a single ADR unit and therefore offers classical one-shot, um, so temporary cooling with a very precise temperature control and hold times of several hours, like here around 30 hours at one Kelvin. Now, this limitation of um, in the cooling time can be overcome by not using a single, but actually multiple ADR units. Such multi-stage systems allow to regenerate one ADR, while the cooling is provided by another ADR unit. In fact, Qtra is the first commercial supplier for multi-stage continuous ADR or short CADR. And now continuous ADR offers the same benefits as classical ADR, plus permanent sub-Kelvin cooling. So the CADR principle is implemented, for instance, in our L-type cryostat with an L302C configuration. In this configuration, we have a serial arrangement of three ADR units. It therefore offers, of course, the classical one-shot ADR operation down to 100 millikelvin, plus additionally, the new continuous CADR operation down to temperatures as low as 500 millikelvin. So based on the ADR and CADR method, Qtra builds cooling solutions that stand out due to multiple benefits. First, cryogen-free cooling independent of helium-3, which makes these systems both affordable and future-proof. Then there's a large temperature range that makes these systems very cost-effective. We offer automatic operation, which makes our cryostats it's very fast, simple, and reliable. And therefore, they're also ideal tools for rapid prototyping, high throughput screening of samples, but also R&D, for instance, in shared facilities. And finally, our cryostats have a modular architecture and can be upgraded at any time, making them very versatile and highly configurable. So you may now ask, um, how is all this related to quantum communication? Are cryogenic temperatures necessary at all? And um, well, the short answer to this is yes, absolutely. So in fact, many hardware components um, that are required for quantum communication still depend on cryogenic temperatures, for example, photon sources. We have heard about HX, um, great technology earlier in the sessions, um, and they work at low temperatures. So not at very low, but still at cryogenic temperatures. 
single photon detectors. In fact, cryogenic superconducting devices, as an SPD, they have been mentioned earlier as well, are among the most efficient um, detectors for photons available today. And finally, quantum memory is a key ingredient for future quantum repeaters, and many promising candidates for quantum memory work at cryogenic temperatures, like defects in solids or quantum dots. I think in Europe, we're in a great position to develop and leverage QKD hardware. We have world-class universities and RTOs, many national and international research consortia with significant funding have been formed to consolidate and accelerate quantum research and adopt um, quantum technologies. And there are, of course, many established and successful companies working in this area, some of them even leading in this field, um, including an ever-growing number of innovative quantum hardware startups. And of course, this list is by no means um, complete. So teams that work on quantum hardware are not always familiar with cryogenic equipment. To develop, to investigate, and finally to employ new hardware, engineers would therefore benefit a lot from easy to use automatic cooling solutions. Moreover, if we consider the future application of quantum hardware in real world industrial QKD networks, compact, low cost, integrated components are desirable if not mandatory. In a similar way to operate low temperature QKD devices, we will require affordable, compact and highly integrated cooling solutions. Now at Qtra, we believe that magnetic refrigerators can provide an ideal platform for both the development and the operation of low temperature QKT hardware. This is due to several benefits that come with magnetic cooling. Notably, cryogen-free, helium-free free operation. This results in a compact size, fully automatic and robust operation, low maintenance and therefore high cost efficiency and still very low sub-Kelvin temperatures can be achieved currently down to 300 millikelvin in continuous mode using QTRA's CADR approach. Now, obviously, magnetic refrigeration also involves magnetic fields and many quantum devices are extremely sensitive to magnetic fields. We're therefore often asked if ADR or CADR cryostats can be used to study or operate quantum devices at all. And this is, of course, possible. So first, TADR uses lower magnetic fields compared to classical one-shot ADR systems. Second, the residual fields are minimized by means of compensated superconducting magnets, which we develop and build in-house, passive mu metal shielding, and finally, smart engineering that optimizes, for instance, the position of the sample stage with respect to the stray field. To illustrate the benefits of magnetic refrigerators, I would like to introduce to you um, a product that we have recently developed at Qtra, the S-Type Essential. This refrigerator can integrate up to two ADR units for either one-shot ADR or two-stage continuous CADR operation. Due to the closed cycle cryogen-free implementation, we can realize a small footprint and a very compact size um, for a sub-Kelvin machine. This even allows to integrate the cryostat, the control and the user electronics into a standard 19 inch rack. So this system from the very beginning has been developed to be a highly configurable platform that can be easily adapted to various scientific and also industrial applications. It offers continuous cooling down to 300 and one shot cooling down to 100 millikelvin. Owing to the cubic geometry of the cryostat, um, the size available in the 19-inch rack um, is used in an optimal way, resulting in, in a lot of free space for user components. And there are two large user ports and a large low temperature stage um, to ensure a simple, straightforward integration, even of complex low temperature setups. Just to give you an example, the cryostat can easily accommodate DC wiring multiple RF or wires or, or um, optical fibers, photon detectors or sources, as well as related low temperature, low noise electronics. It can thus be used both as a research and testbed system and as a platform for QKD applications. 
we think that um, particularly QKD setups, which make use of superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, can benefit from the very low temperatures provided by our cryostats. Superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, or short SNSPD, are among the most efficient and fastest photon detectors available. They are therefore very useful for long distance fiber based QKD. In fact, almost all the current transmission distance records of QKD, fiber based QKD, have been obtained using such SNSPD. So, a SNSPD consists of a microstructured um, meandering pattern made of a superconducting material, often transition metal compounds. So this nanowire is then cooled down well below its superconducting transition temperature and biased with the C current, which is close to, but less the superconducting critical current. Now, when a photon hits the nanowire, it will create a resistive hotspot resulting in a steep voltage signal that is amplified and detected. SNSPD can be fiber coupled and easily integrated into cryo um, refrigerators. The performance is very high, but it decreases at the telecom and longer wavelength. This loss in performance is less significant when the SNSPD is operated at lower temperatures. Therefore, for the operation of SNSPD at telecom and longer wavelength, lower temperatures will be beneficial. QTRA is therefore partnering with the Walter Schottky Institute, the Center for Nanotechnology and Nanomaterials at the Technical University of Munich. And in a joint research project called Mark One, which is short for Modular Quantum Detectors, the Walter Schottky Institute will develop high efficiency SNSPD. To leverage the benefits of continuous sub Kelvin refrigeration, QTRA will integrate these detectors um, with our continuous magnetic cooling platform. So please contact me if you would like to learn more about this project or if you are interested in testing your own detectors or hardware with our cryostats. On my last slide, I would, sorry. <laughs> so on my last slide, I would like to summarize the key messages of this presentation. Um, the first is Europe has a very active academic and industrial research community that develops components for quantum communication. The R&D will benefit a lot from easy to use cryogenic equipment, obviously. QKD networks will require integrated QKD solutions, including also affordable, compact and highly integrated cryogenic solutions. Finally, SNSPD are high efficiency photon detectors and very useful for, for fiber-based QKD. For the operation at the telecom and longer wavelengths, however, lower temperatures will be beneficial. Magnetic refrigerators can meet all these requirements. They are simple and robust tools for R&D. They can be implemented in a cost-efficient, compact, highly integrated way for industrial tech. And they can provide very low sub-Kelvin temperatures independent of the supply with cryogens. Altogether, therefore, magnetic refrigerators can provide an ideal cryogenic platform for low temperature QKD hardware. Okay, that was it. I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Alexander. Um, there is a great comment from uh, Ruth Hubert um, that your technology is a smart idea and she was wondering um, why this idea was not commercialized earlier. So I think it's a very good <clears throat> comment for you. Um, there's also a question um, about the cooling power of your system at 100 millikelvin. Yeah, so right now we, we don't offer continuous operation at 100 millikelvin. Therefore, we cannot specify cooling power. Cooling power can only be specified for um, continuously working cryostats. Um, we can only specify cooling capacity. Usually we specify hold times um, of um, typically three to five hours at 100 millikelvin in classical one-shot mode. And we offer um, continuous mm -hmm. cooling um, down to, for instance, 500 millikelvin, typically with um, cooling powers of around about 50 microwatt. So this is, of course, not a lot, and it's, for instance, not enough for high cooling power um, um, demanding applications like full stack quantum computers, but it's, it's easily uh, sufficient for cooling of detectors. And it's therefore a very useful tool for such um, communications applications. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is another question um, for local control, or is this an external sample? Yeah, so we will use in, in, in this um, setup, which um, together with the Walter Schottke Institute, we will use an external sensor that is located right next to the SNSPD um, on the low temperature stage. And um, here we will benefit from the very precise temperature control um, of magnetic refrigeration. Because unlike in other uh, cryogenic systems, here we have the, the possibility to tune the magnetic field to control directly the temperature. So there is no need for um, temperature control via resistive heaters or needle valves, unlike in other systems. Okay, thank you very much. Then one last question. Uh, you mentioned the importance of partnerships. What does a good partnership look like for you? Well, for us, um, I mean, we're now a startup, so we're also like an industrial player. Um, for us, um, it's very important to um, partner with, with RTOs and, and research um, institutes and universities to be able to um, use state-of-the-art equipment and um, stay in touch and to learn most importantly, learn about their requirements. So I think it's very important because the whole field develops very quickly um, and um, we really need to, to learn more and constantly learn about new requirements and new developments um, to, to be able to adapt our technology and develop our technology accordingly. Okay, thanks again. I think there is another question in the chat. You can maybe answer it there. Yeah. Um, then we can move forward to the next speaker. Um, it's uh, Dr. Kevin Füchse. Um, he's CEO and co-founder of Quantum Optics Jena. And I'm very curious to learn more about um, what he's talking about, the high performance entangled photon sources for quantum communication. Thanks, Kevin. Johannes. Uh, I hope my mic worked. Yeah, everything oh. worked. Perfect. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody um, to my presentation. Johannes, many thanks uh, for inviting us um, to this presentation or to this uh, webinar. So in the next minutes, I'd like to uh, yeah, um, show you some ideas, uh, what we have planned, uh, what we are looking for. So let me start um, just with the slide uh, where we are coming from. So uh, Quantum Optics Jena, so the name is in our company name, <laughs> or the, the city is in our company name. So we are located in the city of light, uh, Jena, uh, right in the uh, uh, so-called uh, Thuringian Innovation Park, um, nearby the uh, Ernst Abbe University for Applied Science. And we are quite new uh, since we are founded uh, three months ago. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to announce today that we uh, finalize our um, funding or we get investors on board. Um, so with the um, ELAS technology investments with the Fraunhofer um, Tech Transfer Fund and the uh, Beteiligungsmanagement Thüringen GmbH, uh, we are quite curious to start uh, our activities uh, with these uh, three partners. So, but we have a background, of course. Uh, so our background is uh, from the Fraunhofer Society. Uh, we learned a lot uh, in the Fraunhofer IOF. Um, and just some quick advertising for uh, my colleagues at the Institute, uh, what they have done. So at the moment, they are looking into uh, also turnkey quantum light sources. Uh, they working on uh, quantum link technologies, um, efficient quantum state analyzers, um, especially in micro optical elements. Um, and of course, uh, state converters uh, and link interfaces. And some of you had heard a little bit uh, with the talk from, uh, from the HHI. Uh, so Fraunhofer IOF is also involved in the uh, QNET initiative. So uh, if you have some uh, R&D questions, uh, I uh, really uh, uh, can yeah, offer you to go to the Fraunhofer IOF. They also have uh, a lot of background in the quantum field. But now we want to talk about entangled photon sources. And uh, as you know, there is a lot of magic in quantum physics, um, especially with the two uh, yeah, main properties in terms of superposition. You, you quite know, or you, you should, uh, you will know uh, the Schrödinger's cat experience uh, where the cat is alive uh, and death at the same time. And uh, another uh, quite interesting uh, property of quantum physics um, is entanglement. And this is one of our uh, yeah, key physics law, which we use uh, for our photon sources. 
But uh, we as Quantum Optics Jena, where we want to play, um, so we want to, uh, to develop uh, key subsystems and systems uh, for quantum technologies, especially in the fields uh, which are mentioned at the desk. Uh, so uh, quantum computing, uh, communication, uh, and imaging and sensing. So in the next uh, couple of minutes, I only will uh, show you some of our activities in the quantum communication uh, field. But if you are interested to learn more uh, about our activities in imaging and uh, photonic systems for quantum computing, uh, just connect uh, with me uh, afterwards. So as we learned, uh, quantum key distribution is uh, yeah, a very promising technology uh, to, uh, um, yeah, to look, go through the thread of the quantum computer. Uh, there are a couple of uh, yeah, papers and works uh, regarding the, uh, um, yeah, the power of quantum computers. Um, and if you're going back through the idea of uh, quantum key distribution, um, there is yeah, the basic is we have the uh, communication layer between Alice and Bob, and typically uh, we have some kind of key management layer um, to establish a key which secures that uh, we can uh, yeah, communicate privately uh, between Alice and Bob. Uh, but there's the threat of the quantum computer. So the idea is to add this kind of quantum layer uh, with the help of uh, QKD. Um, to establish a new kind of uh, key management or uh, key uh, generation. And uh, Quantum Optics Jena, uh, we are really looking forward to uh, building systems with entangled photon sources or with entangled photons. So entanglement in this case means uh, we have a quantum state entangled in two uh, photons. Maybe in the future uh, we have hyper entanglement with, with more than uh, two uh, um, yeah, uh, elements or two photons. Um, but this is a, uh, yeah, is a way to go. And the basic idea is uh, at this point, uh, you, you have this entangled photon source, which generates this, um, this entangled photon pair. And then you send uh, this entangled photon pair uh, to Alice and Bob. And if Alice or Bob, uh, it's vice versa, measures uh, the photon, it actually knows what the other side had uh, at the opposite. So this is uh, one key property of uh, the, uh, the QKD protocol with, uh, with entangled photon sources. Um, and it's a statistical process. So we don't uh, need at this point uh, any uh, algorithms or something else to generate this uh, statistic. It's from basic physics um, or basic physics at the end uh, delivers uh, this uh, from scratch. Um, as mentioned before, uh, if we then want to yeah, deliver this quantum key or this uh, QKD signals, uh, there are many opportunities. So you can go through a fiber signal, you, you can uh, use free space links uh, like the HHI has demonstrated, uh, or you can go to satellite constellations. And uh, we are really looking forward to go with our products into this uh, segment as well. Um, if you then think about uh, multi-user scenarios, so I th that's probably the, uh, the point uh, Max uh, mentioned in the future, so Gen 3 or Gen 5, uh, 4, uh, uh, we can think about uh, EPS sources uh, in the center of, uh, of a multi-user network and then uh, working as switch, for example. Uh, we also have the opportunity, if you're going to long distance, uh, we can think about uh, trusted nodes, uh, or if they are available, uh, of course, quantum repeaters, uh, then we don't need uh, trusted sources anymore. But uh, this is maybe a, a longer way to go. So what we want to do as uh, Quantum of the Jena, uh, we want to focus on, let's say, photonic hardware. Uh, and the connection to interface or crypto boxes and uh, at the end, uh, complete uh, networks. Uh, so our key point or our starting point will be uh, customized photon sources. I will show you a little bit more uh, in the next slides. Um, coming soon, uh, we hope to, um, yeah, to deliver analyzer systems uh, for these entangled photon sources. And of course, uh, we need uh, key generation and key management systems. Um, which then should be established um, and built or integrated into the, um, into the systems or into the, the IT networks. So we have a long track record uh, within our company uh, with entangled photon sources. Uh, so the blue dots um, is, are the, the papers uh, Fabian Steinlechner and his team uh, also prepared in a couple uh, of the, the last years. And our goal will be uh, to deliver high performance um, 
entangled photon source uh, high performance in terms of the pair rate uh, per milliwatt uh, pump power at the end. Um, so one of our uh, first things uh, could be uh, or is a, a space proof entangled photon source. Uh, you might see this from the uh, colleagues of Fraunhofer IOF as well. Uh, that's something like the initial of our uh, commercialization activities uh, within quantum optic Xena. And uh, we, they put together a really nice presentation about or a nice video how this works. So uh, I'm really looking forward to share this with you. Uh, so that's a, a schematic uh, of the uh, entangled photon source uh, within a, it's working in a, a Sagnac loop. So we have now this uh, pump uh, laser and there is a, we, we look through a single photon. Uh, it goes through a beam splitter and then the photon should decide uh, goes it uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise. Uh, uh, but you know it goes both ways at the same time, so a kind of superposition. Then we have this nonlinear crystal, which is key, uh, which generates uh, two photons uh, out of the pump laser. And then we put them together uh, with the, uh, at, the, uh, at the beam splitter. And there, at the end, all the magic has happened. Uh, and we got um, two entangled photons, um, which we then can use to send one uh, to Alice uh, and the other uh, to Bob uh, to build up this um, this system. So the the project here was uh, together with the uh, ECOCI in Wien uh, and the ESA. Uh, so also the, uh, these partners uh, should be mentioned. So going forward, um, in terms of uh, if you look through fiber connections, uh, then of course we have to miniaturize uh, everything. So this will be one of our first products as quantum optics Zena. So it's a miniaturized entangled photon source. Uh, it's a really compact design. Uh, we actually uh, plan this uh, with a footprint of 10 centimeters uh, times eight centimeters. It will be plug and play. Um, um, yeah, a system. So uh, put in the pump laser and get the fibers out and it will generate uh, roughly uh, or more than 1 million uh, entangled uh, photons uh, with a fatality um, bigger than 95%. And at the moment uh, we build the system up uh, with uh, 780 nanometer and 840 nanometer. But of course it will be possible to change this um, as well. So to sum up, uh, what we are offer uh, at the beginning will be uh, customized uh, quantum uh, photon sources uh, for QKD systems. Uh, on one hand, uh, satellite-based, uh, so space-proof systems, and on the other hand, fiber-based, so with this compact miniaturized systems. And uh, hopefully uh, we will uh, ramp up very quickly uh, with the help of uh, our team uh, to deliver at the end customized uh, quantum analyzer systems. Um, quantum key generation and management systems. And of course, uh, at a, as a service, we want to, uh, um, yeah, to integrate uh, this infrastructure or these systems into uh, established networks uh, or infrastructure. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us, visit our website, uh, or just uh, use the Q&A uh, within this talk. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much, Kevin. <clears throat> There's... Um... So the first question for you, um, what are the current commercial advantages of using quantum light sources for QKD compared to QKD implementation with classical light, for example, gigahertz clocks, uh, weak co uh, coherent pulses? So we, we believe that the, um, the entanglement um, uh, approach has one, um, one advantage uh, in terms of um, yeah, you don't have the, uh, you, have the you do not have the, that's a stupid source if you want. Uh, so there is no information within this uh, laser system. So nothing is stored. Uh, so we don't have this, um, uh, yeah, we do not have the, uh, or hackers will not have the opportunity to uh, compromise the system. Uh, and of, uh, what we believe is entanglement uh, is, let's say, maybe. Uh, the, a technology which is a little bit more futuristic in terms of uh, thinking about quantum networks. So if you connect uh, quantum computers, for example, this might be not be able with other um, systems at this point. Uh, so entanglement will play a role in this game as well. Okay, thank you. And then for you, um, also the question, what does a good partnership look like from your point of view? 
Uh, in Germany, it will be a partnership of Augenhöhe. Well, I don't know it uh, at, uh, in English, so sorry. So, so for us, uh, partnership is uh, uh, a win-win for both parties. Um, so if we have the feeling that uh, with, with partners, we, we see a win-win situation uh, for both parties, uh, then it will be a good partnership um, because everybody, so, or uh, on the other hand, uh, quantum tech is uh, a quite new technology. So we should work together, uh, all the companies, uh, to really establish this, um, these new technologies uh, in the society because uh, we believe that there will be uh, um, many advantages uh, in terms of quantum technologies. Is it quantum computing? Is it quantum communication? Uh, we see a lot of opportunities uh, for the society, for, for everybody, and this uh, here we should work together uh, to really make this happen. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Then one last question for you. Um, do you use special kind of fibers and fiber connectors? Um, I guess yes, but I'm not the expert to answer this question. So if you have a, a special uh, request uh, or uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, question, just write me an email. Uh, I will forward this to, uh, to my colleague, uh, Oliver de Vries. So he's the CTO of the company and he's quite uh, yeah, a specialist in fiber and fiber lasers. Okay, perfect. Yeah, then thanks again, Kevin, for your insightful Welcome. talk. And um, we will go on to the next uh, speaker. It's uh, Dr. Matthias Lienert. Uh, he studied physics at Göttingen and Cambridge University, obtained a PhD in mathematics at the LMU. And in January, he joined the Research Institute uh, Code from the Bundeswehr University in Munich. And he will tell us more about uh, his new project, um, the quantum internet in the Munich area, MuQuantNet. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, very much uh, Johannes, for this introduction. Um, let me briefly um, share my slides. So can you see these? Yeah, you can put it in full screen mode. Okay, very good. Can you also see the mouse cursor? I don't see the mouse, no. Okay, that's, uh, that's good to know, okay. Well, um, yeah, um, Thank you very much again for the introduction and um, welcome everybody to my talk um, about the MuQuanet project, the quantum network in the Munich area. Can you start the uh, presentation mode of your presentation? Um, I, I see. have. You have, okay. Maybe you okay, have. Okay, it's not working. I, I can see it uh, very well, so it's also good. So I can't see what you're seeing, so um, you can see the presentation mode? No, it's, it's uh, PowerPoint. Not okay, so it's, it's not in the presentation mode. Okay, so last time when we ch checked this worked, but um, maybe I'll stop this and share the whole screen, then it should work. Does it work now? Yeah, no, it's perfect. Okay, that's better. Okay. Strange that it didn't work. All right, so this is a very new project um, at the Research Institute. Um, code for cyber defense, cyber defense in the um, sense of IT security. And the project is funded by uh, DTEC.BW, the Center for Digi Digitalization and Technology Research of the Bundeswehr. So as I mentioned, this is a very new um, project. It has just started in 2020 in, in, in fall. And the first uh, employees, including me, um, have been have now been hired. We're still hiring, by the way. So if you're interested, maybe um, shoot us a mes message, take a look on our website. And it will run um, for four years until the end of 2024. So this is very much a work in progress. We are just in the kind of starting and planning phase. So um, yeah, keep that in mind that a lot of these things uh, will be very high level and um, still in the planning stage. The context of the, pro of the project is something that has come up a lot here already and that we all share. Namely, um, the challenge is that um, pretty soon scalable quantum computers might make many of the existing encryption methods insecure. Now, besides um, post-quantum cryptography, um, quantum key distribution is um, a main answer to this threat. And the goals of our project are the following. First of all, we would like to build up a quantum communication infrastructure in the Munich area, thereby connecting several different par partners 
Um, first of all, our research institute to the main campus of the um, Bundeswehr University in Munich, then also to um, the University of Munich, where um, we have a, a partnership with the experimental physics group of um, Professor Weinfurter, um, as well as the um, German Aerospace Center, where we collaborate with Andreas Spurl, um, and the CETES, which is the um, central um, federal office for information technology in the area of security. And perhaps um, also other partners that might join the project in the future. We, um, so since we're coming from a um, computer science perspective, we're very interested in the aspect of the quantum key distribution key management and um, to test and implement different concepts for that. Um, coming from an IT security background, it is um, of um, highest importance to us that um, the systems will not only, QKD systems will not only be built up, but also later um, scrutinized and tested by performing classical um, and QKD specific security analysis. Um, finally, um, we would also like to kind of show the usefulness of um, QKD by um, implementing different use cases where sensitive data or classified data are um, encrypted using QKD. But more about these later. Um, so this layer model might already look familiar to you um, from Kevin's talk. So um, we again here have um, the rough schematic of such a quantum um, communication network. We have um, three different layers, the quantum layer, the quantum key management layer and the application layer. So talking about our project, what we like to do in these levels is, so in this low level, um, uh, so there will be um, the QKD components, the physical devices for optical fiber connections. And um, in particular, um, in, a collab in our collaboration with the Weinfurter group, there will um, also be a, a free, free space link constructed as one part of the project. On the um, key management layer, um, we are especially interested in analyzing and implementing different quantum key distribution um, concepts. And on the application lab, lab, um, layer, we will find, well, the end users, perhaps satellites um, uh, and other applications. And um, we are interested in implementing um, two um, main use cases here. One is about um, the secure transmission of aggregate social media data, and the other is about the secure maintenance of critical infrastructure that, of course, comes up a lot also for military system in the Bundeswehr. As, again, um, there will be a part in this talk a bit later where I talk about these use cases in a bit more detail. Let me first come to the part of infrastructure. So how is this um, quantum communication network going to look like? If you look uh, at the map of Munich, you'll have five different locations. And kind of the, the first one is the main campus of the University of the Bundeswehr. The second one is our research institute code, which is um, located um, near the Aspen station Leuperlach Süd. So this um, link between um, these two will be the first link that will be established, hopefully in the first um, quarter of this year, or soon in, in early in the second quarter. And um, the next link will be that to um, the CITES in um, Zahmdorfer Straße. And um, after that, well, okay, and so this link I hopefully um, managed to establish and um, in the third, maybe perhaps a second to third quarter of 2021. And then in about 2022, we plan to um, connect the LMU to the network as well. The final link between DLR and LMU is um, supposed to be provided by a Bavarian study of the so-called QCOM. And um, thinking about the future, I mean, we would very much appreciate and be interested in if this um, network could eventually be connected to other locations within Germany, for example, um, Erlangen and Berlin, where we've already heard about the um, QNAP project. Let's come to a, a bit more de detail of the architecture of the project. So here on, on this, um, in this um, drawing, you find again the five different locations that will be part of um, our MUPANET project. 
and each of these locations, um, you will have a server room, um, which sir, where um, where where QKD devices and um, PCs for the quantum key management will be located. And they serve as trusted nodes in the network. Perhaps in the in the more distant future, um, if quantum repeaters become technologically realized, we would also be very interested in kind of seeing whether that would be something that could be integrated in our network. But for now, that's um, pretty far into the future. At each of these locations, you will have a bunch of application um, PCs connected to the network. Um, that's actually also an important part for from the IT security perspective, especially because this last link is usually not provided by optical fiber, but more often by just conventional copper wires. So you will have a non-QKD part in the overall network, which also needs to be analyzed from IT security perspective, so thereby leading to questions about yeah, IT security in a hybrid, a QKD and conventional network. So these conventional parts of the network have to be secured by classical encryption devices and VPN devices. Now at um, two different um, locations, we have something kind of special integrated in the um, network, namely um, on the main campus of the Bundeswehr University, the research group by Harald Weinforscher in collaboration with us will implement um, a free space link, which you see here. Um, by connecting the DLR, on the other hand, um, we will be able to use the expertise of the DLR in um, QKD satellite, in providing QKD satellite links. And um, perhaps also on the main campus of the um, Bundeswehr University, the aerospace engineering um, plans to launch a satellite actually for a different purpose, the testing out pho photonic um, data rates, but perhaps that satellite could also be used to perform satellite QKD. But it, that is um, still to be seen whether that works out. All right, um, so talking about the first steps in our project, um, the, the pilot project will be um, to start kind of small with the first three links in this um, network that I show, showed before. So between um, first um, research institute code and main campus, and then to the CITES. In um, an architectural scheme, this will look like follow, follows. Again, we have here the three different server rooms of these locations. In each server room, you will have QKD devices. These devices, um, in that case, are um, Clavis QKD devices from the company ID Quantique, our industry partner. They come in, in two different versions, um, a sending device e A for Alice and a receiving device B for Bob. So the middle node will have two of these devices and will have to serve as a trusted node to kind of resend the, the keys sent between these two locations. The quantum keys in turn um, go through um, um, a key management layer and can then be used by classical VPN and encryption devices to secure data transmission between the actual application PCs. Now, I'm um, talking briefly um, about um, this kind of special part, the free space link, um, where we collaborate with the Weinfurter group and try out free space QKD technology. That will be implemented on the main campus between two different buildings, that of the computer sciences and of the electrical engineering. So you can imagine that the optical devices will put, be put on a, on a roof um, between these. And um, so satellite, um, so um, free space QKD can be performed there. That's also quite interesting to try out different technologies for performing QKD in the same project. Yeah, so far about the infrastructure, let me now come briefly to the two use cases, to the main two main use cases that we envision within the project. The first use case um, is also called Adrian for Authority Dependent Risk Identification and Analysis in Online Networks. Well, quite a scary title. But what it's about is um, the secure transmission of aggregated social media data. So you can imagine from the internet, let's say from Facebook or whatever social media, 
um, you have kind of pretty publicly available raw content. And from that, using data science methods, um, sensitive data, for, for example, digital twins or, um, or um, other profiles that can be used for, let's say, like the threat, um, threat level of a certain person can be distilled. And this is quite sensitive data and it is in need of um, a good encryption. And this encryption in our project will be provided by QKD. The second use case is a proof of concept for secure remote maintenance. So um, a situation you could have in mind is that the Bundeswehr wants to update, say on a naval ship, the firmware of the ship. So a kind of very sensitive system, no other state um, should have kind of access to that information. And um, you would like to prefer, um, have a very um, kind of secure transmission of, of, of this firmware update. And um, that um, can be realized by satellite QKD. In our project, we will not actually do that with an actual naval ship or something like that, but um, we'll um, implement this as a, as a proof of concept where the free space link will kind of simulate this satellite transmission. And um, we will uh, remote uh, try to remote control, a, a, let's say, a robot and update its firmware via a, a QKD secured link. Um, a further use case, actually, um, which I don't have on the slide here, is um, to, to look at um, the user interfaces for QKD systems. Now, um, coming towards the end of my talk, let me mention all the different partners that are involved in the project. Um, concerning faculties and institute of the Bundeswehr University, um, besides our, um, so our research institute is actually hosted at the um, computer science department. Besides that, the electrical engineering will be involved in the um, free space link. Uh, very important partners of ours in the public sector of universities is the LMU and the research group of Professor Weinforter. The Technical University of Ilmenau um, will, together with um, our industry partner Zekunet, be involved in, in developing um, a, a QKD key management system. Actually, in parallel with, um, um, so yeah, the kind of comparison of different technologies with um, our other industry partner, Rode and Schwarz. The um, University of Applied Science, um, FH Bielefeld, um, is involved in the use case with the aggregated social media data. The DLR is one of, one of the main locations that will be connected by the network and also has expertise in uh, QKD, uh, in, in satellite QKD. Um, we also have two different public authorities involved in the project. It's CITES. Um, is kind of interested in, in trying out QKD technologies and will also be connected in the MuCoinet project. And the uh, BSI, the um, Central Office for Security in Information Technology, is um, in general interested in, in QKD and the standardization and certification aspects of QKD systems. And they, they will also actively follow our project. And we have joint meetings with them. Um, in um, in industry, besides um, Seconet and Rodin Schwarz that I've already mentioned, um, a, a, an important partner of ours is ID Quantique, which um, provides us with a kind of first set of um, QKD devices, the Clavis system. Yeah, with this, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing to a close already. In case you're interested um, in our project and would like to know, know more information, um, from the official side, you could contact um, our project head, um, Professor Helmbrecht. Of course, I'm, I'm also um, happy to answer questions now or um, later by email. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, I would feel much better to have a secure uh, connection for my social media data here in Munich. <laughs> Looking forward to the results of the project. That would um, be great. Yeah, here's one question for you. Um, do you plan to use um, post-quantum cryptography algorithms to secure the server or nodes as well? Uh, that's a very good question. So um, I think we, are all, we would also look like to look into that for the, um, for the classical parts of the system. So I, as I said, um, not all 
um, parts of the network are actually secured by um, QKD, but it looks more like a hybrid network. And for those parts um, of, whoops, um, of the project, which are not secured by QKD, conventional parts, we would, um, yeah, as in this picture, these ones, um, yeah, they will be secured by VPN devices, and we, these VPN devices will also have to be um, kind of quantum secure. And yes, we would um, like to look into um, post-quantum cryptography solutions um, for these as well. Okay, great. Um, do you plan to test some flying nodes, for example, drones, um, like mm -hmm. China recently presented? Um, so we saw a ship on your slide. Yeah, that, that was um, um, very present recently in the media. So uh -huh. and we were also very kind of excited by by this idea. So yeah, um, it, it came up during discussions. It's nothing is fixed as planned yet. I'm also not completely sure about the experimental physics challenges that would come up with that. But um, it is certainly a possibility we would like to look into as well. A nice okay. technology demonstration as well for proof of concept. Yeah, sounds great. And if we talk about China, um, can you compare the technology readiness level of your project um, to their demonstrations? Well, our project has just begun, so I mean, you can't really say much about that. Of course, it has been very impressive what, what China Maybe has Maybe you achieved. start higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, our project has really just um, just started. Okay. We have just yeah, received then, the first yeah. devices so, and, and are testing them. It's not that this this is actually set up yet, so we are just about to set up things. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you, Matthias. Um, then I will hand over for the last speaker introduction to Frank. Thank you, Johannes. And uh, with that, I would like to um, welcome uh, Dr. Helmut Grieser to the uh, Zoom floor here today. Um, he is Director of Advanced Technology at Adva Optical Networking. And since 2016, he has been responsible for advancing innovation uh, to enhance the capacity, range, security, and agility of optical networks for data center interconnects. Um, and um, or the span uh, of the technology uh, is from data center interconnects to long haul transmission. And uh, prior to that, he worked as one of the company's principal engineers. During his career, he has uh, authored and co-authored more than 100 technical publications, and he is a frequent reviewer of scientific papers. His research activities include digital si signal processing, uh, coding, and encryption for optical communication systems. And before joining ATFA, he had senior positions in research teams for Ericsson, coordinating projects uh, focused on high-speed optical fiber communications uh, and leading uh, fiber uh, communications research. He has also worked uh, as a research engineer for Marconi and he has a master's degree and a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Ulm. And in his talk today, he will shed some light on quantum security for optical networks. So uh, Dr. Grieser, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much for your kind introduction and um, also thank you for inviting me to uh, present. My first question will be, uh, I guess you can't see the screen yet. So I'm just trying to share the presentation. Uh, looks great now. Looks good? Yeah. Okay, can you see the laser pointer as well? Yes. Okay, great, yeah. So uh, then um, I will um, in the presentation uh, have a look more on the system level. Um, we have we've heard a lot of presentations uh, about components for uh, future quantum communication systems. Um, similar to the previous speaker, I will focus more on um, at the system level and um, also on um, the, the near-term future, not so much on uh, the for, uh, future future systems. Um, now switching doesn't work. Oh, okay, here we go. 
Okay. Um, just a very uh, sh one short slide on ATFA in case you don't know ATFA. So ATFA is an optical um, or in general communication systems provider with a, with a focus on optical communication systems. So we are offering um, optical communication systems for the core, for Metro, and also for the access, for example, for 5G backhaul and um, for data center interconnectivity. Um, we do have uh, sites in Germany, in Munich, in Berlin, uh, and uh, in, in mining and in Thuringia. Um, but we also have sites uh, in other parts of the world for the US and in, and in Europe. Um, when uh, talking about um, high-speed uh, data transmission and the uh, encryption of those uh, data, um, I just want to have a, a, a short glance on how those systems look today. So basically for uh, efficiency reason, uh, reasons, every encryption system uh, works uh, with a symmetric encryption system. That's usually the AES-256. Uh, you have an encryptor and you have uh, a decryptor and both are fed with the same key. And the challenge here is now how to transmit the secure key in a, uh, in a secure way. And that's nowadays usually done by uh, a so-called key exchange scheme, um, which allows to um, transmit uh, the key over an insecure channel. It's all, these systems are also called public key uh, encryption systems. And one example, we have mentioned, we have seen mentioned before is the RSA. Another example is the, the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Uh, now we heard about uh, the thread from the quantum computer already. I can make that short. Uh, you may argue quantum computer is still uh, some time out, but uh, the immediate thread you have to consider now is that actually um, people would be able with a, a, a future quantum computer to break the key exchange protocol. But what you can do today is already, you can store uh, intercepted data and you can decrypt it later once you have a quantum computer powerful enough to, uh, to break the public key scheme. Uh, this is the reason why it absolutely makes sense to think about the problem now to start thinking, uh, also take into account that it takes some time in order to adapt your uh, systems to, uh, to that threat. Uh, now, if we uh, think about potential use cases, so, so um, for QKD, obviously QKD is an option for the key exchange that solves the quantum uh, computer threat problem. Um, and um, I wanted to uh, emphasize that there are basically two notions of security you can think of um, with uh, which you can achieve with QKD. So uh, the left one is the information theoretical security where you would need to uh, do the key exchange uh, for one-time petting. That uh, means that you do have to um, um, use a, a key that has the same length as your message. So you can only have as high data rates as your uh, quantum key distribution can uh, transmit the, uh, has, can transmit the key rate or, or the secure key rate the QKD system uh, can achieve. Whereas another notion that doesn't go for information theoretic security is uh, that you still use the symmetric encryption, CES, which, uh, which is weakened by the quantum computer, but actually still uh, secure enough. Uh, and uh, you can achieve, uh, similar to nowadays, very high data rates. Uh, and such a notion is actually suitable for high-speed uh, communication. Um, if you uh, talk to... Um, to people, there's a, there's a huge interest in into QKD and uh, also into the question on how to integrate that into optical communication systems or communication systems in general. And within the Open QKD uh, research project, we are actually uh, supporting and uh, helping to set up uh, a whole range of uh, uh, use cases and uh, QKD test systems. And as you can see, there is uh, basically almost every 
major uh, service provider in Europe is, uh, is involved in one of these uh, systems. Um, and um, this certainly will give um, a lot of insight into all the practical uh, cases or the practical um, circumstances of setting up uh, such a system. I think that's especially important for the service provider to uh, to understand the operational uh, conditions uh, that are involved with uh, with employing deploying uh, QKD in a, in a real network, and I think we'll get uh, quite some experience here. Um, coming to um, uh, deployments, uh, you can you can do nowadays. Um, I wanted to to emphasize basically two two different types of uh, of deployments that are possible today. So uh, one one deployment is um, this is a uh, um, data center interconnection, for example, for financial institutions, uh, where you do have um, a relatively short fiber link, uh, maybe smaller than forty kilometers, and it's a point to point connection. Um, where you can employ uh, QKD for the key exchange. Uh, if you want to go uh, longer distances, uh, as had been mentioned before, uh, with today's technologies, you have to integrate so-called trusted nodes. And that's what had been done uh, for the uh, quantum communications hub link that had been mentioned in the first presentation as well, which consists uh, currently of a uh, I think meanwhile it's four uh, nodes in the in ring in the in the metro area of Cambridge, and a trusted node link between Cambridge and the BT uh, research facilities in Industrial Park, uh, and Adfa provided uh, the communication equipment for this, um, uh, consisting of I think it's five five hundred gigabit per per second transmission, and the particularity of that uh, link is actually that. Uh, the quantum channel is transmitted on the same fiber as the data channel, so you don't need an extra fiber in this configuration, uh, which uh, which obviously makes uh, uh, saves cost, but also makes the um, uh, technical um, conditions more more challenging. But uh, what you actually can deploy now is, uh, and this shows uh, the um, the encryptors, the transponders. We we with encryption we do we do offer with a specific QKD interface, you can use to uh, to uh, to source a key from a QKD device uh, directly um, into the encryptor and uh, encrypt high-speed data. So the left one is for 10G, the right one is for 100 gigabit transmission. And there will be some uh, device for one and 10 gigabit ethernet. And the interface is actually standardized. We talked about standards before. So the Etsy is very, um, uh, active in standardizing um, uh, quantum key distribution. And one of the outcomes is that, that key interface. And our systems should, should be able to work with, uh, with every QKD system that, uh, um, that has an interface according to the, the ETSI standard. Um, looking a little bit into the future, we, we uh, there's a Topic is quantum communications. That's not just QKD. Obviously, what we can do at the, uh, uh, now at the left, that this is trusted node repeater. Um, what we all want to have in the future is a, a quantum repeater, um, uh, which uh, which gives us information theoretic security end to end. Um, but um, this is still some way out uh, until we, we have such uh, quantum repeaters. Uh, it's still a, a topic of research and I wouldn't expect anything commercial within the next 10 to 20 years. Um, nevertheless, um, e What, what you can do uh, are these trusted node repeaters. And they also have um, probably some technical advantages at the moment if you can live with, uh, with the uh, conditions that you actually have to secure those trusted nodes accordingly. Um, uh, this slide um, shows um, a study where we looked into 
if you want to now deploy uh, QKD on a, on a larger scale. So uh, this study is based on uh, the so-called novel network model uh, um, based on, on, on a core net network in Europe, which uh, tried to investigate um, how well would a standard uh, optical network fit to a, a QKD network. And what you can see here, um, the, the red dashed lines are actually uh, connections where it wouldn't be able to uh, to establish a, a QKD a connection with trusted nodes if you just use the uh, amplifier locations. Uh, and that gives you uh, uh, an idea that um, um, either we, we still need to improve um, on the QKD systems in order to, to rule out QKD systems on existing fiber infrastructure, um, or we would need to, to touch that fiber infrastructure to introduce additional trusted nodes. That um, basically, it's, it's basically a study not uh, um, relying on, on, on real network data, but rather on typical distributions of, uh, of span lengths and on typical uh, budgets you, you have from commercial systems. But I think it, it shows that there is still some, uh, some uh, research work to do in order to, to enable the installation on, on uh, existing networks. And my last slide is basically uh, a little bit of advertising. So uh, talking about standards and also, I think many of you of us are pretty European focused and in Europe there are a lot of activities. I wanted to point to an ITU activity that the ITU uh, focus group on quantum information technology for networks, which not only looks into QKD, which is one of the working groups, but in the first working group, uh, the idea is actually to look into uh, quantum information technology for networks in general and for the network evolution that might happen uh, with respect to quantum technology and uh, in the end also about quantum networks. Um, for the focus group, uh, you actually, if you want to contribute, you don't need to be ITU member, so you can participate uh, openly and um, uh, I wanted to, uh, to mention that uh, uh, the focus group plans uh, a, a series of workshops uh, in the next months, um, which are not fixed yet. But uh, if you check uh, the uh, focus group website, you probably can find something in the, uh, in the, in the near future. Just Google for, for Kitan, uh, it uh, will get up uh, the IQ, uh, IQ uh, focus group website immediately. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. <clears throat> um, then we can go directly to the first question um, for you. How do you um, do QKD on the same classical communication fiber, only separation via wavelengths multiplexing uh, or other degrees of freedom? Is this sufficient attenuation of classical light on the quantum channel? So on the uh, sh sharing of the fiber, so it's it's wavelengths multiplexing. Um, uh, usually, if you um, if you want to do uh, if you want to transmit the quantum channel on the same fiber, you try to go of, uh, as far as possible away from from the classical channels. Uh, so uh, very often, certain 10 nanometer is used uh, in order to multiplex with the C-band, which is in the 1500 nanometer region, uh, with the disadvantage actually that uh, the fiber attenuation is higher with certain 10 nanometers, and you you have to pay pay the price in terms of uh, of reduced distance. Um, uh, in principle, you can also um, multiplex with the C-band, but obviously. Um, you, you have to be even more um, careful with, uh, with crosstalk and with distortions from the, from the data channels. And now I probably forget the second part of the question. Um, uh, sorry. Is, is this a sufficient attenuation of classical light on the quantum channel? I'm not sure if I understood the question. Uh, 
then maybe we can go to the next question. <laughs> I think you can answer them later in the chat. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, you mentioned the um, working group zero, I think it is uh, on, on the actual slide. Um, and the standardization, um, do we have um, any idea of the current state of standardization of the process? And yeah, can you say some words to this? Um, the standardization that the question was with respect to? What's, uh, what's the actual uh, the state of the standardization at the moment? Or the, yeah, so I'm, I mentioned Etsy before. Uh, so Etsy is, is very active. Um, so they didn't just standardize the key interface, but they also standardized uh, other parts of, uh, of a QKD system. Um, ITU, and that's what you can actually see here, ITU is also active in standardization. Um, so the uh, study group 13 recently published uh, a range of, of standards for QKD network uh, architecture and uh, key management. And a study group 17 uh, actually looks into security aspects of QKD networks and also into standardization of quantum random number generators. Um, I, the focus group is actually not doing standardization. The, the task of the focus group is really to um, um, to prepare uh, a possible standardization afterwards to look into the technologies, to look into uh, what, what had been standardized before into terminology and um, uh, the maturity of the technology, because obviously, uh, and that's especially uh, the point with uh, uh, quantum, uh, a possible quantum internet or quantum uh, networks in general. Um, as long as it's uh, mainly research, it's difficult to, to, to start with standardization, but uh, obviously ITU wants, wants to be ready uh, uh, as soon as um, uh, there are products upcoming and um, the standardization needs are, are um, uh, evolving. And okay. obviously there are more standardization activities. For example, Sen Senelec also has um, started a focus group more general on quantum uh, uh, technologies. Um, they, I think they just started, so they are not, not very, uh, very long, for a very long time working on this. Um, yeah, but it's a very important topic, so. Yeah. <clears throat> It's great as, uh, that already some uh, groups are working on this. Um, okay, yeah, then thanks again, uh, Mr. Grisa. And um, okay, yeah, maybe, so, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Maybe, maybe we can address that question on um, on uh, on the ah, light. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if I understand it correctly, so the question is basically uh, whether we need some uh, special entangled. Uh, light for, for doing QKD on, on the fiber. So at the, at the moment, QKD is really, so those so, so commercial systems are mainly working with uh, uh, attenuated lasers just, and uh, this is actually something uh, that works well for this prepare and measure systems, for example, for the BB84 uh, or, or similar protocols. Um, so, uh, so from that point of view, there is no imminent need to have, for example, entangled photon sources or single photon sources. But obviously, um, um, uh, such such devices, um, if if available, I I would say in the right footprint and at the right cost point, uh, certainly would help to to improve the implementation security of those devices. Okay, yeah, then thanks again <clears throat> for your great talk and um, all the answers. And I want to invite all the participants uh, to contact the speakers directly for further questions. And um, yeah, please do not hesitate to contact me for an introduction. And I have one quick question to all the speakers. And maybe we can start with Max. Um, what's your recommendation to, to other startups, organizations, or Europe in general? Um, on how to achieve the European industrial leadership. Didn't mute me. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think if, uh, if we definitely knew the answer, we'd already uh, be sure about that we're far ahead. 
Um, I think it's about, I mean, in my view, that's that's about seeing the having a clear picture of the future. I think a lot, um, a lot of that is is kind of what's possible. Um, but you know, that brings the uh, the resource uh, needed to to make it a reality. I think that's the in a very broad terms. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Rüdiger. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Uh, what's your recommendation to other startups, organizations like Fraunhofer um, or Europe in general um, on how to achieve the industrial leadership in quantum in Europe? Yeah, I think there, is, there are already a lot of um, activities, uh, but it's now key to really co collect the different activities um, and work uh, together, uh, German-wide and Europe-wide as well, on this um, yeah, on a, a common goal, let's say. Okay, thanks, Alexander. What's your idea or your recommendation? So I think that has been mentioned before, um, partnerships are very important. Partnerships not only between um, research institutes, but also between research and industry. And um, I think what's important, particularly for startups, is um, that um, they become really part of the supply chain. And that means they're not only participating through funded projects, but um, through, um, say, um, at least paid development projects, which will help to, to um, boost the ecosystem a lot. And um, I, I hope that this is going to be implemented also um, in Germany by, by the upcoming um, um, funding through the Konjunktur program, for instance. I think that would be very important to grow um, and, and foster the ecosystem and um, help startups. So I think this was also your recommendation um, to the um, German government. You were in the expert group there yeah, for the quantum computing roadmap. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Kevin, what's your recommendation? Yeah. Good question. I would say play the game. So uh, there are, it's, uh, it's a good time at the moment, I think. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities um, in research, but we should focus on developing products uh, for use cases and solutions at the end. Okay, and what's, what's very important to um, develop these products? Get out of the lab and uh, do things, I would say. <laughs> Okay, just just do, do not yeah. dream, just do it. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, Matthias, what's your recommendation from more from the university side? Well, in general, I think um, coordinated efforts and common goals, as was um, said before, is quite crucial, I think. So um, we're seeing a lot of different projects and um, if there was kind of more coherence, that, that would, I think, be very important for, for Europe. Also, um, efforts in standardization, I think, are quite important, uh, both for um, um, QKD management systems as well as um, perhaps for infrastructure parts and QKD components. And finally, um, it's also not to be underestimated, um, I think, to have reliable career paths for young scientists. Sometimes these projects are quite kind of short, and also perhaps for startups, I mean, there, there have to be quite courageous people like setting these things up. So I think, um, yeah, like in, in um, perhaps in US or in China, there is um, there are kind of bigger companies or bigger go government enterprises to perhaps also more long term offering kind of good perspectives. And I think we are like also getting towards that. But um, so definitely that's something to keep in mind from the policy side too, so that we kind of keep talents and um, give them space to develop. Yeah, I think talent is definitely a very important part. Yeah. On our way. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Grissom, do you also have a recommendation for Europe and other organizations? I, I I agree with what previous speakers said already. I think we uh, we need to to take care that technology gets out of the lab and we actually uh, develop products so that industry is is more involved into this. Um, at the moment, if you look at the uh, at the players in the in the area, they're obviously they are uh, commercial companies, but but mainly feeding the uh, research uh, requests and and not so much uh, the requests from uh, 
from uh, from users of that technology. That's uh, that's already true for this QKD systems, which actually are most advanced, and you you would be able to. In, 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 in principle, you would be able to buy, but obviously we, di we didn't mention that um, for a QKD system, you need uh, usually a, a certified system that the user can rely on that somebody had a, had a close look onto, onto those systems. Um, but um, in, in general, um, at the moment, I don't, don't see uh, pull enough from, from potential application uh, users of, of that technology. And um, that's, that's that's at the moment it's missing. And 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 the more is true for if you look further into the future for a potential uh, optical uh, uh, quantum internet, as some people say, or maybe um, a quantum network in general. I would probably uh, rather see that as not a replacement of the internet, but rather as a specific network for specific purposes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've noted all those points and uh, maybe we can put them in place in the future. Um, yeah, then thanks again to all the speakers and to all the participants um, for these great talks and these great questions. And um, yeah, I hope uh, we will see us again, um, maybe in the next QPN meeting on quantum communication. Um, and yeah, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, give us a thumbs up if you like it and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And yeah, then stay safe and um, we'll see you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 A big thank you for organizing. Thank you very much.